Okay. Set up. Yes. All right. We can, we can see it. Let's go. Cool. All right. So we are going to be talking about pest control and some IPM this morning. So IPM, in case you do not know, stands for integrated pest management. And how am I? How do I get to the next slide? It's not going. Um, I think you just click your click your um um like the the next arrow or or click your mouse uh that like not, with normal. That is not working. Let's see. Um, you know what? I can do. Oh. It. Look at that. Okay. All I'll right. Be darn. Was that you? <laughs> that was me. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> just All give right, me the so sign and I'll move the slides for you. Okay, cool. So when we're talking about IPM, it stands for integrated pest management. And this is kind of a broad way that you can manage insect pests or weed pests or rodent pests or anything. And you can apply it to essentially any type of environment that you really want to. But you do need to be able to have more knowledge. You need to know what insects in your landscape are going to be pests, which ones are beneficials, and ones that just might be hanging out and really not doing much of anything. You also need to know a little bit about the plants and the control, control strategies, which is what you're here today to learn. So when we're talking about IPM, it does not mean that you are going to have zero pests in the landscape. There's always going to be some level of insects in the landscape, whether those are pests or not. Because if you think about using some of the different strategies we're going to talk about today, one of those is having and conserving the beneficial organisms that are in the landscape that help control those pests. So if you don't have the food for them to eat, which means that you have to have some pests, then you're not going to get those beneficials. IPM also uses pesticides. The thing here is we're not reaching for those pesticides first. We are typically using pesticides as the last strategy that we actually try to move on to. So, and then when we do, we try to use low impact so we can conserve those beneficial organisms. This is going to have a multiple or variety of strategies, and we're going to talk about a lot of those today. And the good thing I think about when I think about IPM is that we are working on preventing a lot of those pest problems from either happening or really getting to levels that are just astronomical. And so playing into that monitoring can actually be very important to the program because that's the way that you're going to know what is in the landscape and what is not in the landscape. All right, Nathan, next. Great. So, like I said, monitoring is important and you have to do this properly. And this is usually where people kind of have a downfall because if you're just kind of casually walking through your landscape or your garden, that's not really what I'm talking about when I'm talking about monitoring because a lot of these insects are going to be very small. And they are also going to be in hidden locations. So if you're not out there kind of looking on the plants, and I'm not saying you have to look at every single plant that's in the landscape, but just kind of go out and pick a few and flip over the leaves, look on the stem, look at around the base and the mulch area and kind of see what you're seeing, just so you can get an eyeball on what might be a problem. So you do need to be able to actually go out there and take a look. Next. Hey, Wizzy, uh, we've had a request in the chat. Could you please turn on your camera so that uh, people can see you speaking? Yes. Okay. Maybe. I turned Maybe. it on. Is it doing anything yet? Uh, we see purple. Oh, okay. What about now? There you are. Okay. Hi. Hey, I see myself. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So upward. Great. If you are monitoring, you may want to use things like traps to help you. And a lot of people will use things like the yellow sticky cards that you see in the right hand side. Uh, there's also other sticky cards that you can buy different colors. There's white ones, there's blue ones, and it really depends on what insects you're trying to attract in the landscape. And you can also, if you want, you can make these yourself. 
get some either like heavyweight paper or poster board that's colored and use some spray adhesive and you can use those just the same as the others. And those are not only going to monitor your insects, but they are also going to kill whatever insects get stuck on that glue. Some other ideas are flushing agents and a real easy one to make is soapy water. And that can help if you're having problems with turf pests that can actually help to irritate the exoskeleton of those insects that might be down in the, the beds or the turf and it'll bring them to the surface. A hand lens is another really good one. A lot of these insects are very, very small and difficult to see. So a hand lens might be an option. If not, your phone has a really good capability of zooming in on stuff. And you can also use that to take pictures if you need to get them identified by somebody like myself. So if you wanna get them identified by me, my contact information will be at the end of the presentation. The other option is for you to try to identify them. And if you do that, you're gonna need collection containers and then possibly field guides or internet websites or something like that to help you out. Next, sorry, I'm still poking the arrow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. Nope, I was just chuckling with you. Okay, <laughs> so when we're talking about monitoring tips, I always tell people they have to think like a bug. When we're thinking about any type of insect, they're going to be looking for areas that have food, that have a place for them to live, or that have water. And those are essentially the requirements that we need to live, but it's also what insects need to live. And so when you're doing this, you have to place those traps or look in those areas where the insects are going to be getting those particular things. So a lot of times when we're dealing with insects, they will follow lines. Think about ants and trailing ants. They typically are going in a straight line and they can follow things like a sidewalk, a driveway, um, the side of the house, a bed, like you see in the bottom left-hand picture. They can even follow the garden hose throughout the yard if you have that kind of laying out as well. But they tend to like more hidden locations and they're going to tend to follow edges. Next. Hey, Wizzy, before we go to the next slide, we had a question from yes. Rebecca about the recipe for your the soapy water mixture for the flushing agent, which is good for like chinch bugs and stuff. Uh, how much water to how much soap? I do not know, but I'm sure that if you Google, like if you Google insecticidal soap recipe, you will most likely be able to find the the exact amount. I, I'm a dumper, so I don't know. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know when we mix up soapy water for fire ants, sometimes it's usually like three tablespoons of soap to a gallon of water. So I wonder if that would work. I, I would assume that that's probably about the same thing because, you know, they're, they're insects and that's going to flush them out. So, yeah, go yeah, with what makes Nathan sense. Says. <laughs> Works for me. All right, so if you're going to identify things, uh, like I said, a field guide would be handy. And that is a really good one that just recently came out by John and Kendra Abbott. It is Common Insects of Texas and the Surrounding States. And that one is especially good for us here in Texas because it is about Texas insects. And it has a lot of great photos and information in there. If you decide to have someone else identify them for you, you know, use your phone camera and the things there are going to really be making sure that you get a clear photo because I get a lot of pictures that are out of focus and it's really difficult to identify what something is if it's just a blob. Um, get up close. There is a zoom function on your camera. Please, please use it because other pictures I get, it looks like a speck of dirt on the ground and I can't tell what it is. And then the other thing is a size reference. And in the picture there, you see that there is a ruler I know or a tape measure. I know not everybody carries that around. I, I completely get it. But use something that is a standard size, like a coin. That way I can kind of get a general idea of how big the insect is that you're dealing with. If you use your hand or a paper clip or something like that, I don't know how big your hand is and paper clips come in different sizes. So that makes it difficult, but, you know, try a coin or, you know, if you happen to have it on you, a ruler is even better. Next. Uh, Wizzy, before the next slide, I wanted to mention 
I know you and I in our pre in our your current my previous life we get pictures of insects to identify and they're upside down, and so we get the belly view with the curled up legs and you can't always tell what that is. So try to get right. a picture of the top of the insect, the dorsal side, if you can, uh, to help out um, whoever you're asking to identify that. Or even so. better, multiple views of the insect. Right. Top amazing. side, bottom, yes. For sure. If we're not asking too much. <laughs> yeah, you know. So the other thing is knowing why those insects are on the plant. Are they actually causing a problem? Are they just hanging out? Are they actually doing beneficial stuff? So when we talk about insects, less than 5% of insects are to be considered pests. And if you see the two pictures here, the one on the right, that big green and kind of pinkish bug that you see is an assassin bug. That's actually a beneficial insect that is a predator of other insects and you see that it's eating a fly. On the left hand side, we have an ant that is tending these little leaf hoppers that are on the plant and the leaf hoppers actually are feeding on the plant. The ant is feeding on a sugary excrement from the leaf hoppers. So this is one of those you kind of got to know what's going on and why those insects are there. But a lot of times when I'm dealing with things that produce that sugary sweet stuff, which is called honeydew, I will get people that see the ants and not whatever's causing the honeydew. And they think that their ants are actually killing the plant and they're not. So it's really important to track down what exactly is going on. Next. So first up, we're gonna be talking in our IPM program about cultural controls. And these are gonna be modifications to normal plant care that will actually reduce or avoid pest problems. Go ahead. So starting off, site selection is a huge, huge thing. We need to make sure that we're planting the right plant in the right location. And that not only plays into native and adapted plants that work well for our area of Texas, but also think about your yard directly. You probably have some areas that are full sun. You probably have shade. If you're not planting stuff that goes in those particular areas, then the plant is just gonna get more stressed and that makes it more susceptible to different types of insects and diseases. Another one, you know, which is great for Nathan and stuff, the, the watering requirements are really important. So make sure that you are playing into that and either grouping your plants or whatever, but you need to make sure that they're getting the correct amount of water. And that's also where if we go with some of our native species, that they tend to have not as high of water requirements for a lot of the uh, tropical stuff that people sometimes like to grow. Another one is drainage. So make sure that not only you're not, you have your soil and your plants being watered, but you need to make sure that that is draining through the soil and that it's not just clumping up and kind of sitting in a particular area. So try to group your plants that have similar requirements together. Next, uh, before we go with the um, great points, I just wanted to mention that to our to our attendees now, uh, who to thunk you'd be getting plant lessons in an IPM talk about <laughs> pest management, you know? But it's very true. It, this is a holistic approach. Um, IPM does include plants, and you and everything uh, that's presented here is so spot on, and people just don't think about that. Uh, they yeah. plant what we're, what we're trying pretty, to do you know? is we want to make your plants as happy and as healthy as they can so they can, you know, kind of resist on their own as much as possible. It's kind of like you trying to boost your immune system by exercising and eating the right foods and that sort of thing. Yeah. Same concept. Great points. All right. So the next one is soil preparation. And there's a link at the top if you want more information on this. But if you're actually building up your soil, then that is going to also help your plants be happy and healthy because we're providing them with what they require to grow. So it's going to improve the drainage the more that you actually get your soil based and mixed correctly. And it also can help add nutrients to the soil. You can till, whether that's with a tiller or a hoe or anything like that, a lot of times that will not only loosen the soil, but if you're turning the soil over, especially at this time of year, that can actually 
uh, expose overwintering pests and that can allow predators and other things to come in and eat those. And then if we're adding compost, that can help to build your soil structure and make sure that they are going to be um, improving that drainage and nutrient intake. Next. And I just put that link up at the top of your slide there, Wizzy. I put it in the chat so everybody can get to it. Awesome. Thank you. And then there, there's another one. So plant selection is also really, really important. Uh, we talked briefly about this, but you really need to focus on plants that are native and adapted to the area that you are. And this is going to help reduce the chance of different pests and different diseases. And the other thing is, it's also going to determine your planting time. So, you know, I know a lot of people are probably prepping for getting their spring vegetable gardens in, and there are also varieties of vegetables and fruits that work in our area. And there's a ton of different publications. You see the one at the top, but I know in San Antonio, there is a demonstration garden at the botanical garden down there that David Rodriguez uh, works with and it, he does all sorts of varieties. And so I'm sure he has a plethora of information. That demo garden is fantastic. And for those of you who don't know David Rodriguez, he is the AgriLife uh, extension agent for horticulture programs here in Bear County. So great resource locally. And if you haven't been to the botanical gardens to see that, you need to go. It is a really neat example of what you can do with uh, the local environment. All right. So watering is another one. Um, this is obviously very important to plants. It's going to create more healthy plants. It's going to improve, improve their productivity. And this is where knowing your soil and how it drains is going to become really, really important. Because if you have a really thick clay soil, then it's not going to drain very quickly. But if you have a very sandy soil, then it's going to drain more rapidly. And why you need to know that is because that's going to affect how you water and there's a way that you can determine what your soil levels are by taking samples and shaking it up in a jar of water and then letting things settle out and it'll kind of show you the structure um i'm not going into that but there is ways that you can do it it's really best to water in the morning up until midday and that's so you reduce the chance of that water sitting on the plant overnight when we have cooler temperatures and that can allow fungal diseases to start sprouting up in the landscape. Um, and then, you know, Nathan can go into any watering restrictions and times and that sort of thing, because that is going to be something that's regulated usually. You can use either a moisture beater to check to see if your soil actually needs to be watered, or if you want, you can have a finger and you just poke that into the soil and see that, and that could be your moisture beater. And then when we're dealing with water, soaker, hoser, soaker hoses and drip irrigation really work best in the landscape um, because they are targeting where that water goes and you're not losing a lot of it to evaporation. And Nathan, with, you know, have anything to add? yeah, I was just going to mention, um, uh, the, the watering window, uh, in San Antonio, you can water up to 11 o'clock in the morning with a sprinkler, with a sprinkler system and then hand water any other time of the day. Um, and then you can use that sprinklers and, and everything again after 7 PM. Uh, if you are local to San Antonio, then, you know, we started stage one watering rules, uh, on Thursday this week. So you are limited to sprinklers once a week uh, on based on the last digit of your address on those times before 11 a.m. after 7 p.m. And um, and then you can water by hand any time of the week, any time of the day that you want. So uh, very apropos at this particular moment. And there was a question uh, in the chat. What is the best time of the year to till the soil? It really depends. I mean, usually if you're going to do that, it's when you're kind of cleaning up the garden and some people do that in the fall to kind of prepare it to be ready the following year. Um, and some people do it in the spring. For me, it really flips depending on when I get around to it. <laughs> I mean, it's really, I think it's kind of better to do that in the fall because 
when you're doing that, then you can also add compost and then that compost is helping to kind of break down and build that soil structure back up. So it's ready to go in the spring. But, you know, if you don't get around to it, doing it in the spring can also work just, you know, a couple of weeks before you're planning on planting that area. Very good advice. All right, next. Fertilization, I, I don't care what fertilizer you use, that's kind of your choice, but you are going to need to provide fertilizer and that's going to provide nutrients to your plant. And if you do not have good soil drainage, that fertilizer isn't going to get down into the root system and that way it's not going to be taken up by the plant. So you, again, all of this is tying together. When we're talking about man-made products, they typically have higher nutrient content, but that doesn't mean that that's what you need necessarily. You might want to do some soil sampling and find out exactly where you are low. Is it nitrogen? Is it potassium? What, what do you need? And, you know, some people use fish meal, some people use bone meal. It just, it really depends on your views and whatnot, but any time that you're using any sort of fertilizer, you need to make sure you're reading and following the labeled instructions because putting too much on can actually be more harmful than your plants than putting none on at all. Next. Sanitation is another one. Um, my pictures seem to be messed up. We want to remove any thick vegetation. So this is what I was kind of talking about with garden cleanup. We need to make sure that we are removing those items out of the garden and all that dead stuff. You can put it into a compost pile, but you do want to kind of break it down before you do that. And this is going to help to remove the sources of overwintering pests. A lot of times they'll be in hollow stems or they'll be kind of down in the root areas. This can also help to reduce any weeds or competing plants that you might have in the area. And we already talked about kind of turning the soil. If you have mulch in the area, you can also turn the mulch over as well. And any time that you're cleaning up in the garden, always wear gloves. That way, if there's something in there like a spider or a scorpion or whatever, then you don't have to worry about being bitten or stung. Next. Spacing is also important. And this is more for diseases than insects usually. It, this is going to allow air to kind of flow through the plants if you're spacing them properly. But if you think about when you first plant stuff in the garden, it's usually pretty small. And a lot of people don't leave room for that to actually grow to the amount that it's actually getting to. And so they'll plant it often too close to the house, too close to another plant. So make sure that you're planting things to allow that sunlight to get into there that allows the airflow. And this is gonna help to reduce diseases, but it can also help insects or reduce insects from going from plant to plant because if plants are touching, that makes it really easy for them to transfer. Another option, especially if you're growing vegetables, go vertical, you can increase your spaces, just build some trellises and you can train the stuff to go up that. That's what I do with things like watermelon and squash and cantaloupe and all sorts of stuff. Next. Mechanical and physical control is probably my favorite. This is all of the gadgety type stuff that you use to manage uh, different types of insects. Next. Um, Wizzy, this, this includes hammers, doesn't it? Yes, hammers or in, your in hand rock. or a fly <laughs> swatter or a shoe or... <laughs> This is, this Anything is, there's a lot of personal satisfaction. Button. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one we're going to talk about is using mulch. So this is going to help prevent water loss through evaporation. It can reduce the growth of weeds. It helps to maintain your soil temperature. It prevents any fungal spores from splashing up onto your plants. And then of course, it also helps to improve your soil structure, which will allow the water and fertilizer to get down to the plants. So mulch is a item that you can use that actually can help control different insects. Next. Vacuuming and hand picking. This is probably my absolute favorite. Uh, more so vacuuming than hand picking. 
handpicking can get somewhat tedious. So it depends on how much handpicking you want to do. Um, you see in the upper left hand corner, that is kind of a commercial bug vac that they have. And, you know, you probably don't need that for your backyard. If you're going to do a vacuuming for the backyard, I recommend a cordless handheld vacuum that is not a top of the line model because you want enough suction to suck the bugs off, but you don't want so much suction that it's going to completely inhale the plant that you're trying to remove them from. The other option is hand picking, which you see on the right hand side. And you can do that if you don't want to actually touch the bugs and pick them off and throw them into a bucket of soapy water. You can take either a jar or something, put either soapy water or rubbing alcohol in there, and you can tap those insects so they drop into that and then they'll end up dying down that way. Next. High pressure water sprays are another one that's super fun. You're not using any sort of a pesticide here and your plants are gonna need to be watered anyway. So these are going to physically knock the insects off of the plant. And a lot of times you will need to spray the undersurface of the plant because if you have things like aphids or white flies, that is where they hang out. They're gonna be on the undersurface of the leaf. And so you need to spray them off from there. So this is going to be a technique that works best on small soft bodied insects because this can actually cause damage to their exoskeleton and that can actually lead to them dying. Also knocking insects off of the plant, then that kind of allows them to be more available for predators to find and eat them. And this tends not to work as well with larger insects that are capable of flying away because they're just going to leave and and then they'll come back after you're gone. Next. Biological control. So I talked about this a little bit before, and these are using organisms to control a pest. So we have three basic types. Conservation is conserving whatever you already have in the landscape. So if you have things like ladybugs, those are beneficial insects. So you want to conserve those in the environment. We also have augmentation which is you purchasing something at a nursery and releasing it into the environment. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you can do, but sometimes that's not economically feasible for homeowners to utilize. And if you buy things like ladybugs, often they fly away from your yard. So they're controlling aphids someplace, but it just might not be where you want them to. And then the last type is called classical or importation, and that's generally governmental agencies and universities that are trying to manage invasive pests. All right, next. Uh, Wizzy, before we go to the next one, um, something that, you know, we, you and I have been um, involved with in the past is the importation and classical biological control. Right. And um, many of the ladybug species in the U.S., have come to us from other countries to mm -hmm. help control pests that came in on on crops and other other materials uh, from other countries. So right. one of our most beloved beneficial insects um, it falls into this category. Right. And well, and then also, because I get a lot of questions on the the Harmonia lady beetle, which everybody sees if you see it in the landscape, you know, and it's eating aphids, that's what it's supposed to be doing. So when you're talking about something be a quote unquote pest insect, you can't just pigeonhole something into that category based upon what type of an insect it is. You have to think about what the insect is, where it's located and what it's doing. Because if we have those Harmonia ladybugs outside eating aphids, beneficial insect all the way. But they also tend to have a habit of coming indoors to overwinter in huge numbers. And in that case, they're not where we want them. They're not what we're wanting them to do. And in that case, they're a pest. So it's not just an insect per se, it's also what they're doing and where they're located. Very true. Um, before we go continue here, um, we, had, we had a request to comment on beneficial nematodes. Oh, okay. So the nematodes that actually um, attack arthropods are in the family Hedonarabidae and Steiner nematidae. 
and those are going to be specific to arthropods and they're kind of generalist nematodes they're already they're free living they move around in the soil and you probably already have some in your landscape so what you would be doing is augmenting that population the thing with nematodes is that they have to have certain soil temperatures but also certain levels of moisture in the soil and typically when people use them to control things it's for things like fleas or white grubs that tend to be needing to be controlled in the summertime so based upon watering restrictions and things like that they may not work as well for you if you can't have your soil be at that moisture level that is needed for the nematodes to actually go through and seek out whatever they're trying to find to eat. Yeah, very true. You'd have to hand water those areas that you treat um, and and to, be, to keep that soil moist because they're actually swimming between the soil grains on that moisture. So these things are so Which tiny. is kind of bananas when you think about it. It is very banana. I just, I have like dune sandworms like in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right, so chemical terminology. Uh, when I talk pesticides, I tend to talk active ingredients. And that is because, well, one, I work for a state agency and we can't recommend specific products. Um, but two, chemical names change a lot. And it may be that you know, one year it's got one name and the next year it changes to something else and it's completely different. I don't know, and that's a lot to keep track of because there's a lot of pesticides out there. But if I talk active ingredients, that is what is in that product that is actually killing the insect that I want to target. And so the active ingredient is going to remain the same. So when I say active ingredient, then that is going to be a little section on the label that you can find, usually on the front of the label towards the bottom, and it will give you the active ingredient and it will tell you the percentage that is in the product. And since that's what's killing the insect, if I say um, Bacillus thuringiensis, then that active ingredient is always going to be Bacillus thuringiensis regardless of what the generic product name is. You may also see uh, inert ingredients on the label. That's essentially everything else that's in the product because that has to add up to 100%. The mode of action is actually how it works. Um, is it a contact where the insect has to touch it? Is it something that has to be ingested and it's a stomach poison? Uh, does it work on the nervous system? So just kind of all of that. And then formulation is really important because that really comes down on how you're going to apply the product and what possible application equipment that you might need to apply it. And I'm gonna give you a hint. Everything you need to know is gonna be on that pesticide label. So if you're reading the label and you're following the instructions, it's gonna tell you where you can apply, it's gonna tell you what you need to apply, not only what equipment you need to apply, but also what personal protective equipment you should be wearing to protect yourself from being exposed to that pesticide. And then we also have different categories of products. Um, when we're talking about contact versus systemic, with contact pesticides, they have to come into contact with the insect, with either you spraying it on the insect or by it being on a surface and the insect comes and walks on it. If you're talking about a systemic pesticide, that is something that you can do a drench at the base of the plant and it gets taken into the plant tissue and it moves around the plant and when an insect feeds on that plant it actually ends up killing it so when you're using systemics you really need to check your label and you really need to be very careful about the usage because if you're using it on something that is a food crop whether that is fruits vegetables herbs nuts any of that there either maybe you can't use it on that or there's a days to harvest so you have to wait so long before you actually eat any of that food that you applied the pesticide to the other thing with systemics is that they can affect pollinators they can get into that pesticide can get into the pollen and the nectar of the flowering plant if you're putting it on a flowering plant so that can cause problems there so we need to be very very careful about that Next. 
So when we're using pesticides, all of these should be used with caution. We need to choose a targeted pesticide if we can. If it's not something that targets a specific group of insects, then we always need to target our location. You don't need to spray absolutely everything in the landscape if you only have a rose bush that's having a problem. So target your treatment area. And then again, I cannot stress enough, read and follow the labeled instructions. You want to mix it according to the labeled instructions. Uh, more or a more strongly mixed pesticide is not going to kill things any faster or any better. And then the other thing, Texas is a site state, apparently, uh, actually not apparently, Essentially, what that means is that it is more important for the location that you are applying that pesticide to be on that label listed as opposed to the insect. So make sure that where you're putting that pesticide is on the label. That is the most important thing. Next. So low impact pesticide options, we have insect growth regulators. These are going to be in a lot of bait products. So these are great things to use for things like ants and cockroaches. And then also, you know, they use these for termites and a lot of the termite baiting systems. But when we're talking baits and we're talking about controlling insects, these can be really great things. One, because you're allowing the insects to essentially kill themselves. You provide them with a food lure that has a pesticide in it. They come, pick it up, they eat it, and they end up dying. So great, great option for controlling things like ants and cockroaches, because especially when we're talking about fire ants, you don't have to go find every single fire ant mound in your landscape. You just get a handheld spreader you put that fire ant bait in there and you apply it on the lowest setting to your whole entire yard and the ants will come and get that for you and you don't have to worry about it. And I am going to say a great option for cockroaches as well. There's a lot of different kind of bait stations that you can get and you just slap those out where you have cockroaches and um, just everybody pay attention. Cockroach is your secret word. What? Cockroach. <gasps> Cockroach Ladies and gentlemen, is your this secret is just, word. This is just like one of those game shows where they're doing the secret word, and it's like you hear the, the host say, the secret word is cockroach. So just remember that, folks. Um, yeah. Those happen have a... to be my favorite insect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So another good option for a low-impact pesticide are microbial products. So these are a lot of the BT or Bacillus thuringiensis products, and these are very targeted to what they're killing. We have BT Israeliensis, which targets, uh, you, those are the things that you chunk into standing water, and it targets the mosquito larvae. But we also have another variety is BT Kirstaki, and that targets caterpillars. So those are very specific as to what they're targeting, so it can help to encourage all of those beneficials that are going to be helping you control those pests because the pesticide won't affect them. Another microbial that is somewhat selectively active is the spinosad product. And these are going to have to have um, chewing mouth parts for them to actually work. So you need to have foliage that is being eaten if you're using a spinosad product. Some other low impact products when we're talking about contacts are going to be soaps, insecticidal soaps, as well as botanicals, which are a lot of the plant products. So things like um, azadiractin, which also goes by the name neem. We also have things like pyrethrum or pyrethrins. And the thing with these is that even though they are low impact and they do come from natural sources, they're still broad spectrum. So if you happen to spray that on a beneficial insect, it's going to kill them as well. All right, next. Uh, one quick question, Wizzy, are neo, uh, neonicotinoids systemic insecticides? Neonicotinoids are systemic insecticides, yes. So things like imidacloprid and dinotefuron and things like that, yes. Yep. So be very, very careful on what you're applying those to. All right, so next. And there is me. 
So like I said, if you need help with identification or if you have questions or if you have questions on pesticides, um, please feel free to contact me. And then if you are interested in more insect information, we do have a podcast that's called Bugs by the Yard. And it is all things insect in the landscape, whether those are good, bad, or indifferent. And um, Wizzy, there questions? was a question. Yep, we had a question in the chat. BT products and caterpillars, does that mean they'll harm pollinators? And I guess the answer is indirectly, it, it sort of. Indirectly, you know. yeah, it can. I mean, it's not, it, BT Kerstaki targets caterpillars, but it does not differentiate between caterpillars that you want to die and caterpillars that you want to grow for the butterflies eventually. So you do, even if you do choose a very targeted pesticide like that, you still need to be very, very careful and make sure that it's not drifting into areas that you don't want it to be. Um, and we do not have any other questions. Um, well, there's one in the chat uh, that says, is borax a good, quote, natural, quote, pesticide? So there are boric acid products and a lot of people will make uh, mix them up and make boric acid baits with them. That, that is going to be a stomach poison. So unless it's ingested by whatever, it's not going to do anything. So typically when we use boric acid, um, it will be indoors. And usually it's going to be either for ants or cockroaches. So boric acid can be mixed in baits for cockroaches and ants. And then the other way that we can get it to cockroaches, because you know, I know that everybody hates cockroaches and thinks that they're disgusting, but they're actually very, very clean. Even though they're found in nasty areas, they groom themselves constantly. And so we use that against them. When you put out boric acid dust in a very, very light film, so we'll put that out like underneath stove, refrigerator, whatever, they walk through that dust and they pick it up and then they're grooming themselves and cleaning it off and they do that with their mouth parts. And so they're ingesting that boric acid dust as they're grooming themselves and then that gets into their digestive tract and they end up dying. All right, well, we still have some questions in the chat, but we have reached the end of our time together. And uh, so I just want to reiterate with everyone, today's secret word is cockroaches. So go over to gardenstylesanantonio.com, go to the event calendar and click on the link for this event. And there's a survey link in there that'll be open until midnight tonight, where you can do your survey, get your one rewards point if you are a Water Saver Rewards member with SAWS. And I want to thank you very much, Wizzy, for coming and and sitting with us today and passing along your knowledge. IPM is an excellent strategy for anyone to use in their landscape, and it is good to see you and um, all the best. And for everyone else, thank you for coming and participating with us today. Sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, uh, but um, I hope that you've enjoyed this event and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. The next event starts at noon. The next webinar starts at noon if you're going to that one. So, again, thank you very much. Thank you, Wizzy. And um, thank you. We are adjourned. Y'all have a good day. Bye.